So at this point, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Amy Sturgis. And uh, she's going to tell you about herself, and uh, she's got some interesting tidbits about uh, science fiction and how it evolved and all that good stuff. to go. All right. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Dr. Amy Sturgis. I uh, am involved in science fiction in a number of ways. Um, first uh, and foremost, I'm a fan of science fiction and have been all of my life. Um, under pseudonym, I also write science fiction and a little bit of fantasy and have kind of a bit of a publishing thing going on on the side. Um, but my primary interest is I, um, I'm a scholar. I do science fiction and fantasy studies. I teach um, at Belmont University courses like um, the history of the future, the 20th century through science fiction. Um, I also teach a J.R. Tolkien class. I just finished a Harry Potter and his predecessors class. So um, I do a little bit of, of both of those things, but I've, uh, I've written on, um, yes. Yes. That is um, that is an option out there. I allow uh, I allow folks to explore their their inner Gandalf in any way they want. Half the to. class quit as soon as they went into that. <laughs> that is not actually a standard part of the curriculum. <laughs> but you know, uh, people can do independent research, and if they want to go that way, you know, that's that's uh, that's their thing. We had the um, uh, Hagrid as um, as Taoist monk in the uh, in the Harry Potter. That's, that's so. a stretch. <laughs> But uh, and obviously, it's a good time to be involved in all of this with, uh, with cinema doing what it is. But tonight, what I'd like to do is um, just talk a bit about the history of science fiction, how that fits with technology, and how I see the genre um, expanding and where I see the genre right now. And hopefully that will fit in enough with the cultural part of, uh, of Freaknik to, uh, to flick a few bigs. First, what is science fiction? Um, the uh, British futurologist um, George Hay says that science fiction is whatever you find in the bookshelves under science fiction at the bookstore. Uh, Brian Aldiss, who both writes science fiction and his history of science fiction, says that science fiction doesn't exist um, and basically writes himself out of, uh, out of the cosmos there uh, because the, the term has been so expanded and um, really made shapeless by uh, different changes in the genre. Um, H.G. Wells had a very narrow definition of what science fiction is, and that is it's everything as it normally is with one slight change, one slight technological change, one slight imaginative change, and then it's tracing, extrapolating all of the things that would come from that one single change. Add two changes, it doesn't work. You have to just focus on the one. But I would have a more expansive definition and say that science fiction is a genre, a speculative genre that asks what if, what if X, what if Y. And really the only specific narrow focus of that is that it suggests some kind of plausibility, not necessarily possibility, not saying that um, this will probably happen, but it's plausible that it could happen. Um, and that is really the difference between science fiction and fantasy. Um, science fiction says, it, it, trust us here, we've got enough levers to pull that it will work. Example, um, really Frankenstein. Mary Shelley begins by saying, according to most recent theories, um, this could happen because uh, we're talking about electricity here and how we're harnessing electricity, right? So s standard throughout Frankenstein then is that these things must happen for the rest of these things to happen. It could happen. Whereas if you take Dracula, for example, um, you just have to take a blind leap of faith. Why doesn't Dracula see himself in the mirror? Uh, you just have to believe that it's because he doesn't have a soul. Now, the most recent chair I've seen doesn't have a soul, but I can see a chair in the mirror. Um, so it doesn't have to be logical. You just have to take that leap of faith. 
but the plausibility is the key that kind of focuses that. Um, and the plausibility is where the science part of science fiction comes in. Um, the edges do get blurred, though, and I'll talk about that in a bit, uh, more so all the time. There's one other thing about science fiction, and it's the reason that I am so intrigued by it, it has been all my life, and that is the key of intellectual excitement. Um, there's something there that grabs you and makes you want to play whatever game uh, the author or the, the um, television creator or the, uh, the director uh, has going, the, the what-if game that he's or she's begun. Um, and I like to think of Frederick Brown's paradigm puzzle there as the classic example of the intellectual excitement that is that spark of life in science fiction. Um, when he wrote, after the last atomic war, Earth was dead, nothing grew, nothing lived. The last man sat alone in a room. There was a knock at the door. Science fiction is what opens that door to see who's there. Um, Science fiction, of course, can be traced back to the ancients, depending on your definition. But for all practical purposes, and for the definition I have, I will take it to Mary Shelley. So um, science fiction had a mother in that sense. Uh, in 1818 with Frankenstein, built on that plausibility model, saying it could happen according to latest scientific theories, and she even lists scientists to whom she's spoken, um, this could happen. And now taking that, let me run with it. Building on romanticism building on gothicism, building on genres that were already there. Uh, she set the stage for something else. And in her work, set the standard for the fact that science fiction would ask questions about power, about coercion, about uh, individual liberty, about questions that are so intrinsic to what it means to be human that really the genre could outlast whatever immediate technological innovation was uh, what started any particular work. Um, she was careful to show plausibility, and she nested her stories uh, by placing the monster story inside of Victor Frankenstein's, and by placing humanity's story inside of the monsters. So um, a lot of things were going on there, and by creating a model that was so complex, she opened the field for a lot of people to come out and play. Um, the 19th century kind of was the perfect moment for her to be doing this, too, because of two specific things. First of all, there was the, um, well, Newton, the Newtonian revolution. By discovering and articulating the first real law of, of science, um, the Newtonian revolution suggested that perhaps, unlike um, in the centuries before, were common thoughts, particularly in the West, that there would be a god who could come in and interact with humans regularly and really whimsically, not according to any sort of you know, regular pattern. Um, this law suggested that things will work the same way every time. There are rules. And if God does step in and take part, he plays by those rules too. So you can take those rules to the bank. That really created a kind of um, ambiguity uh, about the nature of religion, the relationship of religion and nature, um, questions that had been given for a very long time. And so there was this, this open spot created for some um, literary field to take, for, for, for people to run with. Uh, and the second thing was the Industrial Revolution, simultaneously in the 19th century, um, where you have an emerging middle class fueled by technological innovation. The things that were happening in the economy, the fact that these folks could buy things, they, there was suddenly a middle class that had um, an income level where uh, there would be opportunities for leisure and leisure spending. Um, the fact that these folks were literate because education was keeping up with the, the um, economic changes. Uh, all of this was because of technology. As technology changed and made things like the factory system viable, then the way of life of entire nations was suddenly dramatically changed. And in the social upheaval, again, there was an open spot for um, a literary genre to exploit that um, big question mark, what if? And based on the questions of coercion, power, individual liberty, what the good life could be, what it meant to be human, uh, 
the the cradle, the uh, foundation for science fiction was, was um, well suited to step in and answer those questions of what this new world, economically, socially, politically, educationally, scientifically, would really mean. Um, so that's the stage that's set by, uh, by history and by the mother of science fiction. And, uh, and then it was time for the two dads. Science fiction has two daddies. Uh, to step in, um, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. Um, Jules Verne really, in that moment of ambiguity and concern, was praising the rightness of the way that society was moving, thanks to technological innovation. He was very excited about how he saw things uh, unfolding as innovation upon innovation uh, uh, moved more rapidly. Um, his works were called Extraordinary Journeys, Extraordinary um, Adventures. That was the kind of subgenre that he began with works like Voyage to the Center of the Earth, um, 1872. Uh, Verne, by being so positive in his outlook, um, created that pro science. Uh, feeling that certainly Mary Shelley didn't have because she was warning that the power that came with technology, um, the power uh, that came with invention could isolate people and in the end um, give the opportunity for evil to advance. So she wasn't by any means the pro-science person. She was using science and technology to make a point. Whereas Verne is very much excited about this new world that's opening thanks to technological innovation. H.G. Wells' work is considered um, scientific romances, and he played with the ideas. Um, his work was grounded conceptually in a metaphor of evolution, all of his works based on the, the notion of evolution, and so therefore very much grounded in, um, in the science of the day. But he played with those um, with a very light touch. He would, in, in a sense, parody the very things that, that he was talking about. Um, and 1895's The Time Machine is the classic example of how he could um, be uh, both playful and melancholy uh, simultaneously about what evolution would mean for humanity. Um, both of these works, by uh, both of these authors, by being um, both concerned and excited about uh, what technology would mean, set the stage for one of science fiction's biggest contributions, and that is the um, capturing and taking with technology um, the subgenres of utopian and dystopian work. Um, that's why Edward Bellamy um, in uh, 1888 could write Looking Backward, the year 2000 to 1887, and talk about the way he saw um, the ideal utopian socialist state harnessing technology to make sure that everyone was equal in every possible way. Um, that, that excitement and that, um, that positive outlook could play off of things that were as early as, the, as, as um, uh, timeless as the classic works of utopianism. But the instrument to get there was technology. Um, likewise, uh, George Orwell, uh, writing 1984 and 1949, um, could describe a world, a dystopian world, in which the same kind of state that Bellamy was describing um, was in fact very dystopian, was very frightening, was in fact the boot getting ready to crush the face of, of humanity, um, using harnessing technology to get where it needed to be. So utopianism, dystopianism, linked um, by uh, the growing science fiction genre. Verne, H.G. Wells, both, um, are thinking in terms of physics when they're thinking of the science in science fiction in the same way that Mary Shelley was thinking of biology and chemistry when she was thinking of the science in science fiction. Um, Verne and Wells' work then would lead to a lot of people doing secondary kind of knockoff, kind of disposable work 
in which the physics we kind of turn into guys with big guns, right? Which is great, but that's that's what that's what it would be. Um, and in time, the genre would keep that, just like it would always keep and still keeps Mary Shelley's notion of biology and chemistry as the science and science fiction. Um, there is a level of, by ratcheting up that definition of science and adding um, the physics to it, um, there is still that kind of science fiction today where the science and science fiction is physics and the guys have the big guns. And to quote... Um, uh, uh, SLTV um, things blow up real good and that's, that's what they're going for two things help the things blow up real good um, uh, subgenre there or, this, or uh, change in science fiction and first is the post US Civil War explosion of pulp um, uh, publishing, pulp manufacturing of, of works 1868 um, was the first science fiction pulp, magazine, uh, pulp uh, novel called The Huge Hunter or The Steam Man from the Prairies. And after that, an, an entire series of pulp dime novels, basically, that took westerns and just changed them around. So instead of cowboys and Indians, you had um, basically robots. Um, the Steam Man from the Prairies was like a really big steam engine train that could walk and talk and was the Indian bit against the cowboy of the, um, the cowboy being the science fiction pulp hero um, of that era. And it, they were disposable. Um, authors were paid by the word. Uh, so they had every reason to be uh, as, um, as wordy as possible and a pad as much as they could and leave as many cliffhangers so that they would have to write a sequel. Um, they were meant to be read once and tossed away. But with this emerging middle class, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, that had the money to go and buy these, these pulp novels, uh, and that had already read through all of the Westerns, here was a little twist, the same stories retold in a different way. Post-World War I, particularly in the U.S., the pulp industry explodes once again. Um, 1911. Uh, modern Electronics, the magazine, begins with the great editor Hugo Gernsback. Um, Hugo Gernsback is very pro-science and is forward-thinking enough to recognize that really the future of the United States would be tied to its education in science, to w making young people want to learn about science, uh, to inspiring them to being the next innovators. And so even though his magazine was um, really a how-to, a non-fiction publication about the latest electronic things on the market, um, he started putting little fictional inserts there that would maybe explain how something that had been um, uh, described in a non-fiction article uh, might be used in the future in a fictional context. Um, playing around the imagination a little bit and inviting the reader to come in and see the possibilities. Something that's, that's um, unveiled one day um, in a year or 50 or 100 might be used in this way. Um, and so he encouraged uh, really um, the first authors uh, to think about science fiction in a serial format unlike the pulp novels and unlike the great novels like um, Wells and Verne, uh, here was a new outlet for science fiction. And in 1926, he created Amazing Stories, which was the first science fiction magazine. Um, he called it scientific fiction. Had an extra syllable in there, trying to figure out how to put the scientific and fiction together. Um, he wanted to make readers love science and love technology, and he looked for authors who would do that. Um, great authors like Edgar Rice Burroughs of Tarzan and uh, Princess of Mars fame. If, um, if any of the uh, characters could be worked into very small metallic bikinis, all the better. The large guns, the bikinis. It was the big boobs and big guns era. Um, but behind that, there was the honest desire by Hugo Gernsback, for whom Hugo Awards are now named um, in science fiction, um, 
was the, the honest desire to make people love science and to make people, um, to, in, to infect them with that desire to be the next innovators, to be the next turn of, uh, of technology. Um, astounding stories came after that. It became astounding science fiction in 1938. It's now analog. Um, John Campbell, the great uh, editor, um, 1937 to 1971, would sit at the helm of that publication. So now you have competition among magazines. Um, and the first real literary science fiction authors, Asimov, Sturgeon, Heinlein, would be published in these magazines. And here the uh, divide begins between the, the science fiction that is every science fiction hater's stereotype of science fiction that stops with the boobs and the guns and stops when the reader's about 12 years old um, and the great literary science fiction that is saying something more, that is rekindling the spirit of Shelley and Wells and Verne and taking it further. That's where the divide came, when those first magazines began to compete and the um, difference between the pulp, the disposable, and really the... Um, the long-lived and uh, compelling great literary science fiction began. By the 1950s and 1960s, the so-called golden age of science fiction, um, which I think is actually tomorrow, but I'm an optimist, um, the 1950s and 1960s really was the golden age of science fiction because post-World War II, you had this young audience um, really a completely different understanding of childhood than had ever existed, particularly in the United States, um, with the idea that really part of the Cold War, part of winning the Cold War, was preserving that moment of innocence, that moment of play um, for children. Uh, and what was good for children, in a sense, was good for science fiction, because in the um, untrained public eye, science fiction was, uh, was a children's um, genre. Uh, but the children were growing up. By the late 50s, they were growing up and they weren't growing out of science fiction. And they were demanding um, science fiction of real quality. Still with the definitions of the science in science fiction being biology, chemistry, and primarily uh, physics. And of course, the space race having a great deal of impact on that. Hard science fiction, what we consider today hard science fiction, the physics-based science fiction, um, really comes into its own. Verne, Jules Verne, wrote hard science fiction, but in a very satirical way. Um, think of um, From the Earth to the Moon, uh, books like this. He, he, um, he played with and, uh, and had inside jokes for the audience that he knew was, was educated in a way that would understand his jokes. Um, Wells knew science, but ignored it when he needed to. Um, think of the first men in the moon, books like that. Um, he had a point he wanted to get across, and uh, if he just needed to grab a, you know, a large talking praying mantis, he would, and he wouldn't worry about actually how it worked, or how it survived, or how they got there to find him in the first place. Um, writers like Arthur C. Clarke were paying attention, and they were... Um, not treating it as satire, we're not ignoring it when it was inconvenient, we're sticking to the physics, uh, we're sticking to the science. And writers like Arthur C. Clarke paved the way for what we consider now to be hard science fiction. And then if any one person embodied the golden age of science fiction, um, building on the shoulders of uh, Hugo Gernsback, Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein, um, Heinlein was a scientist. He was an engineer. He was trained through the Navy. And during World War II, he gave aviation reports um, and uh, reports on scientific progress for, uh, for the military. But he wasn't interested in the science that he understood for its own sake. And that was key. That's what kept um, hard science fiction from kind of imploding on itself at some point and becoming just a, a thought experiment for you know, five people who got it. Um, he was interested in what those, um, those scientific innovations, those scientific principles meant for larger questions about human progress, 
about individual liberty, about power and its abuse, its use, its possibilities for societal evolution. Um, so he is really, truly um, the, the uh, intellectual heir of someone like, uh, like Shelley, but is trained in what Shelley uh, never, never would have been or would have been interested in. Um, the Puppet Masters, 1951, um, the first great book of his, but the, what I would argue would be the high point of his work, 1967's Moon is a Harsh Mistress, in which um, he was not, again, harnessing the technology for its own sake just to play with it. He was conducting a large thought experiment. What if the American Revolution were replayed this time between Earth and the Moon? and the good guys aren't on Earth, they're on the moon, and how do they fight that war when they're obviously so drastically um, underrepresented, uh, overpowered, and the underdog? Uh, so his big questions weren't about science, but science and technology were, were vital for him to find the answers that he needed and for him to think about what it meant to be human and what a better tomorrow, not a utopian world, but just a better tomorrow might look like and how technology could help get us there. After Heinlein, who was one of the best ever at doing what he did, <laughs> you see my completely unbiased opinion there, um, in the 50s and 60s, that whole physics as the science and science fiction uh, moment, I think, peaked and I think it has, in a way, plateaued ever since then. What happens after that is what I think is really the interesting, interesting stuff. And that is new technological innovations in biology um, and in chemistry, in physics happen. That's why you have Greg Bear and people like that today writing. Um, as the new innovations come fast and furiously, you have people who are, are, are educated enough interested enough and on the cutting edge enough to take those innovations and play out the ramifications of them in different works of fiction. But the real innovation, technologically, imaginatively, has been in the very definition of science itself. So we have on the timeline the science is biology from the very beginning to today. We have on the timeline the sciences as chemistry, science as physics as well um, playing out. But then with different innovators, we have that definition of science ratcheted up. And by ratcheting that up, by opening that question even further, new authors, new questions, uh, new audience members have been added to the genre. The ghettoized voice that was stuck over there with the, um, you know, the foil bikinis and the large guns um, becomes something much more mainstream. And as it expands its old definitions, it expands its voice. Uh, the first way I would say this definition of science gets changed, gets ratcheted up, as it were, um, is by defining the science part of science fiction is anti-science. Even, even Verne was, um, and Wells, who, who were either playful with or occasionally dismissive of the science, were, were positive about the science that they used, even if it was just a literary device. Ray Bradbury is the first person who comes in as a skeptic of science and yet chooses science fiction as his literary voice. Um, the science part of science fiction for Bradbury was a metaphor, and the best example of that is um, 1950s The Martian Chronicles. Whereas um, Heinlein was taking the technology extremely seriously as an agent of his vision in, say, Moon is a Harsh Mistress, um, Bradbury was, was suggesting scientific um, change, technological innovation, as a metaphor to criticize. In uh, Martian Chronicles, his criticism is about colonialism. So in the tradition of the great uh, post-Civil War Westerns that suddenly became science fiction pulp with just a little twist, uh, he would place, say, the American West on Mars and criticize colonialism, criticize imperialism, criticize 
um, the unthinking assumptions lying behind things like genocide, um, and and play them out using technology really as a warning instead of um, instead of a, 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 an exciting possibility. He was worried about what science would mean because he didn't believe that science could change human nature and he wasn't really a fan of human nature. And so more technological innovation simply meant more opportunities for people to do what people do and potentially do them in a bigger and badder way. Um, so using science fiction as his means of, of criticizing science was very interesting and that certainly continues all the way to today. The next big leap in the definition of what science is in science fiction, I would argue, would come with Samuel Delaney. Um, in that sense, the notion of science would be um, linguistics, languages. Um, and by who he was also writing as a bisexual black man in what had been traditionally a very mainstream white man's um, genre, he also opened up the questions about race and sexuality that had not been there before. Um, I would point to uh, 1966, um, his work uh, Babel 17, as the real turning point there, because when you look at um, language, linguistics as a science, then you can talk about dismantling a language as being a weapon of war. What happens when humans are, are targeted and attacked by a weapon that destroys their notion of the word I, for example. Um, this is very sophisticated um, what if uh, uh, potentials playing out. Um, it's being um, very concerned about, again, the notions of power, coercion, individuality, um, what it means to be human. But instead of using um, the traditional uh, notions of science, you're opening the field for a whole new series of questions. Yes? He did. Orwell did, particularly with his notion of newspeak. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. Um, I, think, I think the difference there is, and, and also um, Frank Herbert is doing this. Frank, well, Frank Herbert did everything. It's kind of like talking about... You know, the people and then God. I can't even talk about Frank Herbert because he's bigger than all of this. Um, but you're right, Orwell did. But Orwell used that as one tool of his many. And I think the difference is Delaney used that. He was, that was his main focus. But you're definitely right. And Orwell was, in that sense, very much an intellectual um, father for Delaney and for a number of other people, including Ursula Le Guin and others who would, who would use that um, well. And, and his... His entire um, uh, appendix on Newspeak would be a classic example of that. So you're definitely right. Um, I think I think Delaney focused the attention on that, and because his work was such a turning point, um, those who might not have gotten it before got the fact that that the linguistics was here to stay as a whole separate series of questions. Um, and and the notion of war through language then also playing into what would become the postmodern revolution in, in uh, literary studies uh, also gave science fiction a credibility among scholars it didn't have before, which was um, good and bad, <laughs> depending on your notion of, of how much you want scholars involved in anything. I say that as a scholar. Uh, um, I think a third turning point then um, would be Ursula Le Guin by bringing anthropology and sociology so much to the fore. And again, like Delaney, changing the whole nature of the questions asked, not only by the tools she brought to the table, but also by the very nature of who she was. Gender, uh, although certainly you had, um, you know, James Tiptree and the greats before her, um, Ursula Le Guin, uh, by focusing the question there and by bringing new tools to the table at the same time um, meant, uh, meant just by being there that the question of gender was on the table to stay. By bringing anthropology and sociology from a very academic background um, to 
to the um, tableau of tools that, that could be used, particularly her left hand of darkness in 69 and dispossessed in 74. Dispossessed playing right into that whole dystopian sidebar that's been going on the whole time. Um, really, once again, transformed uh, the dialogue by asking what it would mean to have an, an alien who could change gender at will, to have, have um, the very notion of identity no longer tied to gender, and make that a question of scientific analysis. Um, left Hand of Darkness was just a watershed. As we're ratcheting up the definition, of course, we still have those who are working on the biology, chemistry, physics level, but new voices, new readers, new questions are being asked. I think the most recent and most interesting redefinition or expansion of the definition of science and science fiction um, comes with psychology. And I'd say that um, William Gibson's Neuromancer in 1984 finished what Philip K. Dick had started a, a decade before, um, but had done in such a way that it hadn't really grabbed everyone by, by the shirt collar until um, Gibson did it. Uh, and also, of course, in, uh, brought in cyberpunk simultaneously. Yeah. Okay, this is um, along those same lines yeah. of the psychology, but in a completely different way. If you take um, Maze, like Jack the Body, this and, and yes. all of that, I mean, you can't get much more psychological than, than a being without a body. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Very good point. Very good point. Yeah, so that's definitely out there. You're right already. Um, uh, and and by, by bringing those issues and making those scientific issues and not... Um, fantastical or just mainstream fiction, um, the the dialogue is is changed, um, and by creating characters like Dixie Flatline, um, that then become models for entire generations of uh, authors to think about. Um, and again, Dixie Flatline. Uh, fulfilling what um, what uh, uh, Dick, Philip K. Dick had done uh, earlier, um, and certainly the tone of the work, the the irreverence, the um, the the or uh, the the George <coughs> the H. G. Wells irreverence uh, that uh, that had been there so early, coming back in the cyberpunk mentality, I think brought in a generation that would not have been um, tied into to a literary movement in another way. Looking at where the genre is now, I think cyberpunk has, in a way, grown up. Um, and grown up through Neil Stevenson. Um, that cyberpunk still exists, but cyberpunk has also taken a, another generation. Um, as the, as the technology has matured, and it's now not necessarily um, novelty for novelty's sake, um, that you're in um, a, a, a virtual reality, uh, then really in the same way that each of the pioneers in science fiction has done, um, Neil Stevenson can say, now we're, that we're not so enthralled with the fact this just exists, now that we've kind of gotten over the initial shock, what questions can be answered when we play this out? So in a sense, I think Neil Stevenson is kind of a Heinleinian figure in the sense that he can take that then and apply it and see how different thought experiments um, work out. Um, the furthest implications in that sense for computer technology. Like Mary Shelley on the individual, on society, on what it means for power and individual freedom. Um, I think Neil Stevenson really proves the flexibility of the genre in that way. Um, two current situations then I would see in the literary genre um, some of the best writers by going back and forth between science fiction and fantasy are now really blurring the distinctions between the two. Now you have hybrid works that are, are completely hybrid works that can't be, can't be separated out and you have authors whose voices are not changing uh, going back and forth. Um, Lois McMaster Bujo, who is really the, the Heinlein of her generation in the sense that um, in the grown-up, the 21st century Heinlein, in the sense that she can write feminist military science fiction and things blow up real good. 
and yet she's also playing with a lot of, of um, biological and, and psychological and sociological things at the same time and doing it all in space opera. That's a tall, uh, tall plate for one person. Um, and she's also tied Heinlein with the number of Hugos she's worn, which or she's won, which makes her the only, the living, um, uh, uh, most awarded science fiction author. Um, and of course, Heinlein being her, her, um, her fellow. Um, and then there are other fellow travelers who are in the orbit of science fiction. They're in the orbit of fantasy. They're not really in either one. And they're doing such incredibly interesting things that everyone in both of those genres have to take notice. People like Neil Gaiman, um, who have transformed everything as they go along and don't really fit anywhere and defy categorization, um, but have changed say in the sense Neil Gaiman being the Lovecraft of his generation, changing genres that, in which he doesn't even write just by being who he is. Um, the second thing I would say that's happening that's so interesting is that the, uh, I had said first the ghettoization had changed as new people were brought in, but now the ghetto doesn't even exist. There isn't the science fiction stuff I and mean then the literary stuff because really since the 60s, but particularly today, some of the most stellar contributors to the genre um, aren't even put in the science fiction case that, um, that I talked about when I began in the bookstore. Um, people like Mary Doria Russell are considered fiction, fictional authors. Um, they write fiction and they're put in the literary fiction uh, category. Um, yet she wins the Tiptree Award um, for the Sparrow, and rightly so, and shows that, that there's still an awful lot, awful lot that can be done in the science fiction genre. She's writing a science fiction story that, um, that handlers refused to put in the science fiction section because they wanted non-sci-fi readers to read it. Um, you know, before her, people like Kurt Vonnegut were doing the same thing. Um, but today, I think the new voices coming in are just as likely to be routed into literature as they are to be routed into science fiction. And I think that's very exciting as a reader of and um, a writer of and a studier of science fiction. I think that's, that's very hopeful um, that, in fact, the science part of science fiction has grown so wide that you know, even newer folks can be brought in. Yes. I think, I think there's definitely something to that, yes. And um, that, that uh, well, and, and to, to go back and, and, and use Gibson as an example, when you have someone, you know, naming cyberspace, and five years later, 90% of people are in <laughs> cyberspace. They see that connection, whereas talking in 1870 about being on the moon seems a bit far-fetched. I think that plausibility factor def definitely has something to do with it. We're so... Um, uh, wired now, no pun intended, for, uh, for these quick technological innovations that yesterday's science fiction, and, and television certainly has something to do with that as well. When you see the things that are on, science, uh, on Star Trek, you know, uh, used the next day at NASA or at your grandfather's, <laughs> uh, that, you know, that it, it takes that immediacy away from, from the disbelief. So I guess that leaves us then um, waiting to see what the next uh, leap will be in the definition of the science part of science fiction. Um, or to use Frederick Brown's paradigm puzzle that I mentioned before, to see uh, to whom uh, that knock on the door actually belongs as we sit there in our rooms alone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sturgis, and uh, give us about uh, ten minutes, and we will have the infamous black hats, white hats, and ass hats find out which one you are uh, presentation. <laughs>